Nick, as a materialist, you believe that consciousness is entirely explained by the brain, and in effect, this is some kind of an illusion that is um, that is evolved. Why did consciousness, as we have this subjectivity, this magnificent inner theater of visions and sights and smells that make us alive, why did that evolve? I think you've begun to answer the question almost in the way you phrased it there. We have this magnificent show uh, to which we're the privileged subjects. But in a way, you've, 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 you're ahead of the game there because many philosophers and even scientists have thought the real puzzle is that consciousness doesn't seem to have any outward effects. Um, it's even been suggested seriously that you know we could you could meet a zombie who wasn't conscious and you wouldn't know the difference because the inner light of consciousness isn't actually changing his behavior or her behavior in any important ways. Um, it's been claimed that uh, consciousness is inessential. Uh, philosophers famously described it as being chronically unemployed mm -hmm. and asked, well, then, then why did God bother to make consciousness? Mm -hmm. But I think philosophers and scientists who take that line have really been uh, making g going the wrong direction with it. They've been assuming, in fact, like so many do, that consciousness must be giving us some new kind of skill, enabling us to do something which we couldn't do if we weren't conscious. Mm -hmm. Like say, a bird can fly only because it's got wings, or you can understand what I'm saying only because you understand the English language. But I don't think consciousness, the purpose of consciousness is like that at all. In my view, consciousness is a kind of inner theater. Um, and like theater, its job is not to give us skill, it's to change us, change our outlook on life. As the audience for this magnificent show we put on, we become different kinds of people. We, it changes our sense of who we are, the kind of selves we possess, and also the world we live in and the world which other people live in. So it, what consciousness is doing is not so much enabling us to do something which we couldn't do if we weren't conscious. It's encouraging us to behave in ways which we wouldn't behave if we weren't conscious. And that gives us survival benefits. Yes, it, it, in, in many ways. Uh, uh, I I've, I've can work up, from, I suppose, from the, the, the lowest level of that, that it's, uh, in some ways, it's so obvious. Uh, the, 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 one of the most important things which consciousness gives us is a sense just of joy in life, of delight in being there, of wanting to continue being present in this extraordinary world, which we have been so fortunate as to have been, been born into. Now, uh, that may seem a very low-level function, but imagine the consequences in terms of how it's going to make conscious creatures engage with life, want more of it, even perhaps to avoid the oblivion which comes with death, because uh, they delight in that simple fact of being there. Now, that's possibly present in lower animals. I'm not sure fear of death is present in lower animals, but certainly a delight in living is. Um, and I think a lot of it comes through consciousness, uh, through phenomenal consciousness. They live like we do in the presence of sensations. But for us, it's got to pay off on a much grander level still. It's provided us in the end with our sense of self, our self sense of ourselves as being uh, this extraordinary uh, centered uh, existing entity f centered around the substantive fact of sensation, living in that thick moment and bringing that moment with us wherever we go, waking to it uh, every morning, as departing it often reluctantly as we go to sleep. Um, it gives us a point in life. And building on that, it's led on to all sorts of other grander ideas about the self. That core self, the self centered around sensation, becomes the center of our psychic life. Uh, and in that process, you have to have a conclusion to make it, to make it select, be selected for. That has to have some survival of benefit course. in yes. order that that increase when it emerged. Yes, and what we have to accidentally, do. Accidentally, I assume. I think to understand what the function of consciousness is and why it evolved, we've actually got to go out there into the world and do what I've called the natural history of consciousness. We've got to look around us at how conscious creatures live in this world and how 
their, their relationship to the world and to each other is changed by the very fact of being conscious. Now, that's not a subject which science, scientists, psychologists, philosophers have paid a lot of attention to. They think they can study consciousness in the psychophysics laboratory, for instance, mm. you know, with people looking at, at, at the computer screens. That's not where we're going to find the answer to what consciousness is doing. We need to go out there and see how from the moment a baby opens its world, uh, opens his eyes onto the onto this magical world and begins to think of itself as being such a unique and special creature, uh, gifted with this magical quality of consciousness. How that has changed its life course from there until the day of its death. So, are you tracing consciousness in an individual human life from from birth to death? but also in the evolution of different uh, uh, animals as they become more complex as well. Well, I'd firstly like to take in terms of that natural history. Yes, I think we need to trace the, the, the consequences for a child as it grows through adulthood, right to the day of its death, of how the kind of self, the kind of sense of importance, the belief in its own uh, specialness and in the specialness of the world in which we find ourselves living because, of course, although consciousness is our own creation, we're continually projecting it out onto the world. We see the sky as being blue, the fire as being hot, the uh, the, the bird as having uh, making those, those those sibilant sounds, which are, are actually our own projection out onto the world. And we think of ourselves as being privileged, almost like gods, to live in a universe which is itself an enchanted place. Now, I'm talking you know, on the edge of poetry there, but I think if we're doing the natural history of consciousness, in fact, we should be looking to the writings and works of those great natural historians, the poets, the painters, the, the, the writers about the romance of nature, and of course, the, the monks and the meditators who have given a record of how consciousness changed their lives. That's where we should be looking for the functions of consciousness. And of course, but as biologists, continually translating back this back to saying, yes, and that's why this family would have survived better than that. That's why these children would have explored the world in ways they wouldn't have done otherwise. That's why these parents would have cared for the lives of their children in ways they wouldn't have done otherwise. That's why uh, we humans have entered what I've sometimes called the soul niche a world in which we believe that we and the creatures, human creatures we live among, have been gifted with something quite extraordinary, a human soul. So that payoff of wanting to live because of this soul <laughs> feeling and, and because <laughs> of our conscience, that payoff leading to increased survival is an evolutionary success based on an illusion. Yes, it's based on on an illusion which uh, was set up in order to trick us into believing in ourselves as being more important than in truth we really are.